thank you all for being here. Um, and I appreciate it. You both bring different, all three of you bring different perspectives to this. We're going to start at the end here and work our way down. And you know, what I'd like to do is save time for questions. Is, I, I forgot to ask. Is that OK? Is that OK to do questions? Um, we're going to do it anyway. Um, so that's just kind of how we roll. So we're just going to, we're going to have some questions. We're going to do a little conversation up here. And I really do want people to think about things that they might want to ask so we can make this more of a conversation. Uh, Daryl Darnell on the end here uh, joins us from as a senior associate vice president at George Washington University. Uh, before that, he was at the White House working as the director of critical infrastructure protection and resilience policy. Um, was there even such a thing for? I mean, when did that when did that come about? You know, uh, the name kind of changed a little bit with the change in administrations, but the uh, critical infrastructure protection was always a director within NSS, but the resilience piece was added to I the see. protection. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, you can look at different countries and see when and whether the word resilience comes up. Like I think in the UK, they have a sort of cabinet level office of resilience, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so it was the thought with the Obama administration that we needed to focus not just on protection issues, but also on re resilience issues. And that was a way uh, to, 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 to I don't know, sort of drive that point home. OK. And what were some of the, and before that, I should say, you were, um, you were the director of, of the city of DC's Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency. Um, so. First, talking in chronological order, at the city level, what, what were some of the challenges, the barriers to creating resilience uh, with regards to Homeland Security and emergency management? Oh, I think in Washington, D.C., it's unique because it's a city, but it's also the seat of the federal government, so that brings some unique challenges uh, to bear. But it's also a city of neighborhoods, a 600,000-person uh, population, but also a significant portion of the population, as, as Admiral Allen alluded to, that has uh, significant social economic needs. And when you talk about resilience, I've always talked about there has to be responsibility from the individual, the state, local, and all the way up to the federal level. And if you're really creating resiliency at, at the local level, you really have to figure out where those social economic uh, situations where the government may have to do more but and rely on other people who have means to assist so that the government can, can have more of a, uh, an adequate response, if you, if, if you will. Um, and then also getting people to understand what those roles and responsibilities are. One of the things that I did was I created a blog and a website called 72hours.dc.gov. And it was really tried to get the public to understand that for that first 48 to 72 hours, we're really going to need you to be able to take care of yourself while we really assess what the situation is, where we need to uh, focus our priorities and those different types of things. If you had to guess, what percentage of the D.C. population do you think is prepared to be on their own for 72 hours? Um, not a lot. <laughs> uh, I think it's one of those things where it's, it's a constant, uh, at, at a, at a, at a uh, operational level, it's, it's a constant, uh, excuse me, a constant communication level where you have to continually engage the public. And what we try to do through faith-based organizations, uh, through neighborhood watch organizations, we sort of use the neighborhood watch as sort of a template and a model, something that was already established to go into the community and say, we know your focus is really on ordinary crime, but we'd also like you to try to focus on this, and we'll give you the tools to help you do that. Uh, so that's, that's how we try to, try to approach it. But I also try to take a look at some of the indicators I'm big on you know predictable surprises and those different types of things. Um, at the time I was in the district, nearly 60% of uh, district public uh, school students were receiving some type of reduced lunch for those types of things. So in my mind, that portended that if the children are receiving uh, assistance in lunch, probably their parents were at the poverty level or not much above it. So to expect them to have the tools and those things to be prepared for some type of catastrophe was probably unrealistic. So we spent a lot of time trying to educate that portion of the population in determining what they needed from us and then trying to provide that. Is there a specific example of something that you feel like you were able to put in place? Yeah, I think we were able to put in place uh, exercises, for example, with, with the aging population. So we worked with the DC Office of Aging. And what we tried to do was we tried to identify where people, for example, um, uh, uh, could not get out on their own, where they didn't have a car, or for example, where uh, they may have been on some type of dialysis machine or something that required power. And that really came into play in the summer of 2009 when we lost power uh, in the District of Columbia. 
So we already knew where a lot of those people were in the affected area. So we were able to go in right away, uh, make sure that their backup generators were working. If they weren't working, we supplied them with generators, we supplied them with ice, all those different types of things. And that was really an outgrowth of working with the Office of DC and Aging, knowing where those senior citizens were, working with the faith-based groups, because they know where the sick and shut-in are. And they already have established mechanisms for getting to those people, so we just leveraged what was already there. I'm glad you brought that up because we actually do know a lot about who evacuates and who doesn't, right, before mm -hmm. uh, disasters or after. And we know that in New Orleans, for example, the number one predictor of who did not leave was age. And that actually was also true after Three Mile Island. So even in very different kinds of events, you find that the elderly are the least likely yes. to evacuate, which the older I get, I can understand. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm kind of like, really? I'm not going to get in the back of that station wagon with my kid and her kids and the dog for mm -hmm. 10 hours and sit in the traffic, right? Which reminds me, one of the things, I'm actually glad I have you here, because one of the things I've always wondered is when I see those blue evacuation signs mm -hmm. in D.C., I mean, and I know this is a balance, right? You have to have evacuation routes. You have to do that planning. But there's one that goes right up through on Wisconsin Avenue through Georgetown. I can't get up there on my car on a normal day. <laughs> so what are we doing here? No, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, it's, identi it's identified as an evacuation route because it's a major uh, north-south artery, and we have plans in place to turn that into contraflow and shut that traffic off so that the traffic would go out of the city. You have two lanes. Exactly. Two lanes. On Wisconsin Avenue. And they, but they would all be going out. Okay, all right. Uh, my plan is to use a bike for as long as I can. And that's a good plan. <laughs> um, all right, I want to move next to Jason McNamara, who is the chief of staff at FEMA. Thank you for being here, Jason. Uh, he's spent over 15 years in emergency management, including, among many other things, a stint on the staff of the House Select Committee on Homeland Security. Um, so coming at this from a federal point of view, um, FEMA is a place that is widely misunderstood, I think it's fair to say, and you know, I, I have criticized FEMA in the past, but I've also come to realize that it is, there's a disconnect between what people think it should do during a disaster and what people want it to do before a disaster. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how, do you think that's improved um, over the past few years, that disconnect, and you know, what do you think are some of the ways to deal with the difference between what we say we want our federal government to do and then what we actually expect it to do when all hell breaks loose? Right. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And, it's, and if you follow, if you, you listen to what the Admiral said and actually what Daryl just said, um, with respect to individuals, communities, and then as you take it up to states, municipalities, private sector organizations, um, what, you're, what you've heard, and uh, hopefully what you've heard all day, is, is some increased level of expectation of, of those of you and those of us who can provide for ourselves, who can take care of ourselves, there, there's an increased expectation that you should do that. Now, we can talk about that all day long, and we have talked about that all day long um, in many different venues. Uh, however, when something bad happens, uh, there is an uh, extremely high expectation of somebody to quote unquote be in charge and somebody to fix everything. Um, uh, in many cases, that gets thrown at my agency. Um, the, and we have to, I don't think fight is the right word, but it, uh, as you were saying, in terms of, we have to educate the public and the media about that disconnect. Let me read you something that Craig said in testimony, which follows on to all of this, which is, government can Sorry, Craig Fugate. Craig is Fugate the, is my boss. Is so I'm quoting my boss, which is always a safe thing to do for you guys <laughs> out there. Um, Craig proved it, but he's the administrator, has been since the beginning of the Obama administration. Government can and will continue to serve disaster survivors. Okay, so there's the, there's the recognition and the acceptance and the accountability that, yes, we are on tap to serve. Uh, government is on tap to try to help the population after disasters. However, we fully recognize that a government-centric approach to disaster management will not be enough to meet the challenges posed by a catastrophic incident. That is why we must fully engage our entire societal capacity. Capacity, I thought he said capability. That's the kind of the, the hub and the spoke that we're, that we're working with right now, which is 
we're going to be there and we're going to do everything we can to help the population after a disaster, help the impacted population after a disaster. But there is a limit to the, uh, of the amount of things that we can do and that we can do, more importantly, the things we can do well. Daryl had a great example there with respect to uh, the D.C. Department of uh, aging? aging? Aging. Okay, they know where these folks are. They know what their needs are. They know who the service providers are in the private sector and the nonprofit sector who work with these folks on a daily basis. So as opposed to one way we are trying to be successful, and I think we can be successful, is opposed to us creating mechanisms to serve that population, creating federal mechanisms to serve that population, um, is to leverage the resources of those folks who work with those folks every day. What it's something that I've called in various fora is kind of finding the experts. You find the people who work with low-income populations, elderly populations, disabled populations, children, um, a variety of quote-unquote special needs populations uh, or, or different needs populations is probably a better way to put it, um, that are much better at providing services to those folks than you could ever could be. Last example I'll give, and this is outside the United States, uh, one of the things we do after disasters, we have to bring in logistics and you know, stuff, basically. Water, food, ice, cots, blankets, whatever, you, whatever. Some of that stuff needs to be distributed on an individual basis. The default government position on that is to create a brand new distribution system with, with our own points of distribution, our own staging areas, that type of thing. That is probably exactly the wrong way to do it. There are, there are mechanisms in the community that exist already that are well known in terms of distributing goods and services. And in Haiti, where you saw, and this was us, uh, the United States military trying to distribute goods, you saw kind of the, the failures there in terms of people going, you know, jumping up on uh, helicopters or, you know, kind of fighting for the goods. Meanwhile, in a different part of the country where they used um, established faith-based distribution mechanisms, no problems at all, no issues whatsoever, and, and the, 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 goods and the goods and food and water got out to the people that needed to get out to them. So we need to do a lot better job, and this is what Craig has espoused since the day he got to FEMA. We need to do a lot better job in using the community-based mechanisms that already exist to further our disaster response and recovery capabilities. And if you could give our administration a theme, that's pretty much where, we, where Craig has been since the beginning. So everything we do on a daily basis tries to reinforce that, that theme. So if I understand what you're saying, a lot of this is about, it's basically like you're, all, you're a, an agency full of fixers. You need to have relationships with people and have trust built in with people before. Exactly. And you probably see variation, right, in, from place to place. Like you have FEMA has, you know, organizations all over the country, and you probably have some people where they've got very networked, very, a lot of trust, many years relationships, where it's solid, right? right? And some places where that's not true. Right. Is there any pattern to that? Is there, are there certain things that tend to corrode those networks yeah. and that trust? I think what you can say, you can go back to what, again, go back to what Admiral Allen said about pre-existing societal conditions. If you have an area where there is a history of racism or a history of economic disparity or a history of uh, injustice or perceived history right. of injustice, you will, you will run into many, many more problems in the disaster response phase. Um, it, uh, it, it basically, it will bring those issues, those issues are already to a head, it will bring it even to a higher head, uh, be, and the level of distrust will, will just exponentially grow. And once you're, once you're in that situation, uh, there's really not a heck of a lot you can do to get out of it. It becomes, it's kind of self-perpetuating. Uh, so I guess what I would say is the pre-existing conditions, particularly with, particularly with respect to socioeconomic, mm -hmm disparities uh, become, uh, become uh, they get a spotlight shined on them during a disaster situation. Uh, last thing I'll say about that is, is one of the reasons we, we uh, espouse the kind of, you know, take care of yourself when you can um, uh, mantra is that we do see, we really do see our role as taking care of the folks who can't take care of themselves. Every time, if you're an able-bodied, if you're me, you're an able-bodied, non-minority, upper-income person, 
um, you know, I have a responsibility to be able to take care of myself and my family for a certain amount of time. I, I will tell you, I am, for as an emergency manager, I, I fail in that measure. I mean, we're, we're not, I think we know where to go if there's a disaster, but after that we haven't done much. Um, so so I'm, I, I, am, I am the example of what not to do. Um, I'm just going to call Craig for a second and well, see what he, he knows. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's really I'm having job. a baby during hurricane <laughs> season. I mean, he, he's laughed me out of his office on that one. Um, so if I, if I do what I'm supposed to do, um, governments at all levels, local, state, and federal, can focus, uh, focus the resources on those populations who can't do that, who can't do that for themselves or will have trouble doing that for themselves for, for a whole variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And every, time, every one of me that exists is taking away help from, right. from someone else. Yeah. yeah I mean, but it almost sounds like we're headed in a very sort of leftist direction here. Like, what, the best way to increase resilience would be to fight poverty. Uh, yes and no. True? No, I, you know. I mean, if if we knew surefire ways to no, reduce I poverty. Mean, if, no, 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 no. Well, actually, not necessarily. Let me let me say one thing. Okay. Um, if you got if you got the money and you don't care about the rest of society and you don't have networks and you're not plugged in and you don't and and yeah. you, then no, it won't work. Yeah. But yeah, but it's also not just it. It's also mm -hmm. again Washington D.C. is a good example. On any given day, there may be two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand tourists in in this in this city. Mm -hmm. So if we had a catastrophic incident on along the lines of Katrina, those people they're not going to be getting on any airplanes or any trains home. They're not going to have anywhere to stay. Maybe their hotel their hotel may be destroyed. It may not be destroyed. So they're going to need some type of assistance. Uh, but they have means, but they don't have the means at that particular moment. The same thing with our college A students. We have, we have 10 colleges and universities here in Washington, D.C. Where I'm at at George Washington University, we have 25,000 students. So again, if we have a catastrophic incident, I have to be able to take care of those 25,000 students. So there are a lot of different things that come into play, and I think the important thing is figuring out what it is and then developing those resiliency measures to deal with it. Yeah, and I guess I have seen, not a lot, but I have seen a few uh, small communities that have been around a long time, say in the Gulf Coast, that were, were low-income communities by any definition, uh, but were quite resilient. Well, uh, it, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, here in Washington, D.C., and in, in, uh, in Anacostia, east of the, the river, that's the poorest section of the city, if any of you are familiar with the city here. And the same thing, pockets and neighborhoods where they will tell you, look, we you know, we're resilient, and you know, we've been resilient in a lot of different ways, uh, and we can be resilient during a disaster, during a ter terrorism incident. You just need to tell us what to do mm -hmm. and provide us some of the things that we don't have. For example, I I've had people over there tell me, we're not evacuating. We, 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 we're second, third, and fourth generation Washingtonians. We're not leaving, uh, so tell us what we need to do to stay here. Mm -hmm. and, and you work with them, they go through uh, CERT training, all those different types of things that we offer. They know how to coordinate with us. They participate in exercises, and they do all of those different types of things. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, Craig is, you know, has mentioned this. I think Admiral Allen mentioned it down in, in Katrina. There were areas where people say, we're not leaving, and that's no different here than in Washington, D.C. Right. right, and you can fight that all you want, but you're not going to win, probably. You're not going to win, no. Um, Patrick, I want to ask you to uh, maybe help us put this in some broader context. Uh, Patrick Doherty is Deputy Director of the National Security Studies Program and the Director of the Smart Strategy Initiative here. And he really, I, I think, if it's fair to say, you think about sustainability as a national security issue, which is, I think, a good way to think about it. So can you talk a little bit about what we've been kind of dabbling in here over sure, the last sure. hour? You know, my concern is that we're actually heading into a, really an era in which the services of these two gentlemen is going to be called upon more frequently um, and for higher degree incidents and events. Um, and that to the extent that we can predict that across a, a, a variety of different sectors, those types of disruptive uh, shocks um, to the uh, American population, to our lives and livelihood, we should be able to we should, we should be thinking today about how we design um, an even deeper level of resilience. So what I wanted to do is just share kind of the, the top four, I think, threats that are facing us that I think have started to fuse into one, um, as the systems folks call it, a wicked problem. 
um, that is going to be sh this, that's going to be sending in our direction um, these higher frequency um, uh, disruptive events. Um, the first one is the major financial disruption that we all experienced in 2008, which has now created a moment which we call a deleveraging. Right, we're in the midst of this credit uh, bubble bursting, um, but it's a deleveraging. It's a 10-year process of winding down our debt, and in the meantime, our economic uh, uh, growth is going to be suppressed. Um, that's going to be eating away at our social fabric. Um, it's going to be eating away at, at the resources of our families, of our corporations, of um, our governments, um, to be able to respond to these types of things. Um, so we're, gonna, we're, we're in that moment of deleveraging. The second piece um, is this global uh, uh, trend that I call economic inclusion. We're bringing 3 billion people into the global middle class in 20 years, according to uh, research that we released with the McKinsey Global Institute. Um, when those people come into the, into, the, uh, into the global middle class, their incomes go up 300%. And their resource consumption goes up 300%. We're already seeing this in increased commodity prices. So what's, what, and, and, and one great example of how that affects the American people is what triggered that financial crisis. You had a simultaneous resetting of loans and a doubling of the price of gas. Um, as commodity prices go up, again, our families um, take the, um, uh, bear the brunt. If you're already in the midst of deleveraging, we're weakening that underpinning um, the third piece is ecological depletion, um, um, whether it's the dynamic of climate change or the lack of ecosystem services, whether it's flood control or um, uh, stronger hurricanes or more frequent hurricanes. We're going to be hitting, we're going to be getting more and more disruptive weather events, whether it's the Joplin tornadoes um, or 100-year uh, 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 floods coming every five years. Um, we're going to be seeing those types of Weather events, crazy weather patterns, heat waves, those types of things. We're going to be having that come at us more, fre more frequently as well, on top of these other things. That's depressing. Thanks. Yeah. Keep going. It's, <laughs> it, it's a wonderful world. I live in. <laughs> um, and then the third piece is really um, just this overall pattern, what I call the, the resilience deficit. It's everything that we're talking about today, that we're just not investing in our systems, our supply chains, our structures, uh, our infrastructure. Um, if you look at what the American Society of Civil Engineers says we need to invest in our domestic infrastructure to get us up to uh, zero. It's $2.2 trillion. How are we going to get, how are we gonna get that level of funding in the midst of, de of a deleveraging, in the midst of these deficit problems? Um, so what, what I'm seeing is that these four problems have functionally fused. If you're, if you're the President of the United States, you want to solve one of them, you, you effectively have to solve for all, all four. Um, and that is creating um, this problem. That's gonna, this, this problem is, 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 a low, is a slow speed, high mass event that's already upon us. It's not, it's not like a, uh, one of uh, Vice President Dick Cheney's um, uh, low likelihood, high magnitude events. This is upon us already. All four of these are upon us already. They're slow moving, and so it's harder to see them, but they're functionally fused, and the way we're experiencing them is through their symptoms, through the shocks, sh shocks and disruptive events that are coming at us. And so what I, would, I just want to kind of raise that awareness out there that that's the, that's the strategic environment in which we're facing. And, and, it, and it gets into kind of the, the strategy of great powers as those commodity prices move north, especially around energy and water, strategic behavior follows and armies and aircraft carriers go with them. Um, so this, this type of behavior, this, these patterns are going to have a full spectrum of consequences for the United States. And, and, and I'd argue that they're actually not um, amenable to what we normally think about economic policy with monetary policy and fiscal policy. And they're not amenable to military strength. Um, we, can't, um, we, we can't militarily defeat climate change. Um, or we can't stop 3 billion people from coming into the global middle class. And so what we're going to need to do is think about how our systems and structures and infrastructure is designed and to address this world um, that we're coming into. Now, the good news is, um, and I'll stop here, is that there's, there's actually incredible pools of pent-up demand. What we're experiencing is a system misfit. that We've, we've been running a, um, essentially an economic system that was designed to help uh, the United States 
uh, go through the Cold War, um, uh, essentially an economic system that we never reevaluated after the end of the end of the Cold War. And as a result, there's massive pools of pent up demand in the system that the, 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 what people want has dramatically changed. And we've got, um, whether it's uh, demand for housing, we all know that demand for housing in the suburban fringe is really low. But what we don't know is that the National Association of Realtors is saying 56% of Americans want um, a home in a, a smaller home in a, a walkable, service rich, transit oriented community. Um, which are fundamentally more economically, uh, ecologically sustainable, um, but they're also uh, much easier to provide emergency services to. Um, if you're out in the in the vast distributed suburbs, um, it's really hard to get emergency services out to that distributed population, and especially when they're all cul-de-sacs, you can't get an emergency. You, you get a, it's really hard if you've got one tree down across a key uh, contributing uh, street. There's hard to get out to that cul-de-sac. Um, in time to save lives and reduce suffering. Okay, so, so you're saying about half the people want to live in cities. Half the but don't people, they already live in cities? Like half the people. Half the people want to live in a community in 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 a house that they don't already live in that is smaller, oh. that is in a walkable community. Okay. And that community is service rich. It's got the restaurants, the schools, the uh, healthcare um, that they want, and it's the um, uh, and transit oriented. And the dynamic is that baby boomers are downsizing, retiring. Um, and they want to, some of them are retiring, some of them are going to have to continue working longer. Um, and, they, and they don't want to do the 200 hour a year commute anymore. And they, wanna, they don't want to get locked, they want to get stuck at, out in the suburbs without um, a driver's license or the keys to their car. Meanwhile, the millennial generation, their kids, 77% of them just don't want to go back ever to the isolated suburbs. Um, they're just uh, too, um, too static. Uh, and, and isolating, they just don't want to go back. So they're going to make inner cities and, and first ring suburbs that have much better infrastructure work again. So that's really great, but in, it's an incredible pool of demand that's pent up um, because we're still subsidizing this old suburban model, which is really hard to secure um, and, uh, and make less vulnerable to disruptive events. Okay. So that's your good news, is that there people... That's part of the good news. Okay, nothing else? The other good news is that <laughs> the, is the flip side of bringing 3 billion people into the, yeah, <laughs> into the global good. middle class. Um, that's an incredible new uh, pool of customers, of clients. Um, and, and could uh, raise wages. Could raise wages over there, Globally. which would, could raise yeah. wages over here. Um, China has a, raised rates. I mean, if you look indeed. at programmers, the cost of a programmer per hour in the D.C. area uh, went way yeah. down. And has now started going back up as, as the cost of programmers in India has started going up. Exactly. And the, the interesting thing about this is that if you can reduce, if you can, the problem is that as they come in and we're, we continue business as usual, um, with the resource, level of resource intensity of the American or average global econ economic or unit of GDP, um, we can't do it. But if the United States says, hey, look, we're going to take this opportunity to lead a revolution in resource productivity, and to um, draw and to be that um, harness the, the inventiveness of the American people. Um, at the same time, we're reinventing our communities to be more um, sustainable, more resilient. Um, we have uh, a global demand piece that's driving uh, exports and I improving um, um, uh, improving economic. Uh, uh, outlook in the United States. At the same time, we're building a new American dream that's fundamentally more resilient. So okay. we've got this interesting, we're at this interesting moment where um, we've got these macro challenges um, and some macro solutions. But because I think of the dynamic of crises and it, within our public sphere, we're all always focused on this, the next crisis. Right. And, and the challenge is going to be how do we look at the at this bigger picture. Uh, we're in an interesting time because this is one of those periods of national conversation. I don't know if we're going to get there. It doesn't look that good based on the, on the Republican primaries. But we've got another moment where we're the, at least all the party, all least, almost all the candidates are talking about big problems. Uh -huh. The question is, can we get to the, to the big solutions? OK, all right. Speaking of big solutions, I'm relying on the audience to come up with some. I'd like to take at least one or two questions. Marie's got a microphone here. So uh, we've got a hand behind you and a few here. So why don't you go right here? We'll start there. 
Hi, uh, Jamie Ewald again. I also work for state government. And one of the things that I found in, in my job is the challenge of institutionalizing sustainability, systems thinking, resilience thinking into the short term thinking of politics and policy. And with the panel that we have up here, I was hoping that you could address some of your ideas of how we institutionalize long-term thinking, precautionary approaches in government, whether it's at the state, local, or federal level, to address these challenges, because that's the only way we're going to be able to do it. Anyone care to take how do we ins sort of institutionalize right. um, long-term thinking? You know, I, I think, you, first of all, I think we understand, we have to understand that politics plays an important and a huge role in what we do. And depending on the, the political party in power, everyone has their different priorities and those different types of things. And I think you have to accept that fact as reality, first of all. Then I think, secondly, I think it's determining what your priorities are. Because as much as Patrick says these are interconnected systems and things like that, the reality is, particularly in the economic, economic times that we live in, we're not going to be able to do everything. And so I think we have to figure out what our priori priorities are, prioritize them, and then you know, focus on those priorities. It may be one or two things, it may be three things, you know, whatever it is, and, and focus on that and not think that, you know, for lack of a better phrase, that you're going to be able to change the world because you're not. And you know, that's just from my own personal experience at working at all levels of government, at the federal, state, and local, and, and now in the private sector. And so I think if you, if you do that, I think you, you tend, you, chances are you'll be more successful. But aren't our priorities, right? Aren't our priorities usually what we can deliver in two and four years? And what our legacies are for that, you know, no. administration? It, it, it depends. Yeah, I, I yeah go ahead. Yeah. It depends. I mean, it depends if what you're, if you're, if you're talking about individual goals and objectives, yeah, it is. All right, so what can you do in two to four years? But what we, you know, what I hope we will do is be able to put in place, a, a, you know, systems that, you know, last much longer than that and to kind of become institutionalized. I mean, the whole goal here of what I've talked about and what Craig talks about all the time is being able, is being able to show that this approach to my profession, to emergency management, is the successful approach. It is the way to do it and that resiliency as a concept means what we have been talking about. And that frankly, the only way we get that done, and this has been demonstrated, is to succeed. So if we have our Katrina this year, please, no. I mean, I, just, I can deal with a fairly large target, but not a giant one. Um, if we have that and we, and we attack it with the, same, the principles that I kind of outlined today and we succeed, Yes, I think we can make changes for the long term. I think just to tag on, I think yeah, quickly the question, though, I want to be able to get one more question. The, the question is really about being able to um, budget over a longer term uh, time horizon and being able to, to make trades on investments today that will provide a longer term reduction in costs, both budgetary costs and, and uh, human and, and uh, civilian costs. You want to go to the gentleman next to you, Marie? Um, Mike McDonald, Global Health Initiatives. So um, I'm wondering what would it take to develop a national sustainable security infrastructure initiative that would address some of these at the top level policy, but that would actually go all the way down into the neighborhoods building neighborhood resilience networks that have all the fundamental networking capability that you would like to build in. FEMA is already doing this, for example, in San Francisco, supporting it uh, at a theoretical level. But there's no real resources to build this kind of thing. So how do we enable a broader whole society approach to get the investment that's necessary combined with some of the leadership from government? Well, who, is there anybody here from New America that has money that I can <laughs> talk to? No, actually, I, and, and the, while that's kind of a, a little bit off the cuff. It's it's not too far off the cuff. I mean, there. This is not. If if you believe what I said and you believe in the principle that was just articulated, then it is a responsibility. Yes, is it partially our responsibility to fund and kind of seed these types of efforts? Yes, it is. And I think, you know, we're starting to do that. But I think it's kind of a more distributed responsibility where you have a number of folks that need using, as you said, our guidance, our ideas, our principles to, to uh, take that and run with it. 
uh, in, 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 a, in a number of parts of the country. And they're actually, we've talked to a number of foundations who once, if we can get it going, if we can see that, that they would be willing to kind of take up the cause for us. So. I mean, the federal government really can't do that in, in this country. Oh, well, we could have we spent an enormous I mean, amount of money. Don't you think the locals aren't going to trust the federal government to do that? I mean, it depends. That... We come with a big check. Sometimes they do. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hate to say it, but that, that's, that's but, absolutely yeah, right. But that, certainly that's a part of it, but I also think it's a culture. And I, and I think this administration, you know, with Craig, has, has, they've done an excellent job in trying to do that. Uh, the Presidential Policy Directive 8 that talks about national preparedness in the first paragraph, it talks about this being a system-wide uh, responsibility at, at the federal, state, local, and private sector and the individual level. That's never been in presidential doctrine before. This was the first time. But I think it's also uh, an awareness issue and a communication issue to the public. And I liken it to, to the no smoking campaign. It took 35, 40 years before we changed the culture that smoking was not a good thing from a public, poli public health policy standpoint and a societal standpoint. You know, now, you know, people take it almost for granted, you know, that the vast majority of Americans don't smoke. Well, that was a 40-year education campaign to do that. And I liken this as the same way. If we're really serious about resilience, it's going to take something that takes over time, is which is why you see programs that are geared towards uh, school kids' children, uh, uh, school-aged children, similar to what we did with, you know, uh, uh, Smokey the Bear, as, as, as my good friend Mike Byrne used to tell me, he said, I grew up in Brooklyn and we didn't have trees, but I knew who Smokey the Bear was. <laughs> you know, so I think it's, this, it's the same type of issue where we just have to const continually and constantly push that message. Yeah, and creatively too, right? I mean, I think exactly. one, one asset that I, I think we have is, unfortunately, millions of experts in evacuation in this country. And yeah. there are places in this country that are used to evacuating. They know how mm -hmm. to do it well. They know what to bring, what to not bring. Uh, and I don't. I feel like we could do a better job telling their stories and really highlighting resilient communities as in a storytelling fashion, right? As a, as a model. Absolutely, and I think FEMA has tried to do that with some some programs that they've had, where they've taken a look at, for example, the Lakeview neighborhood in, in uh, New Orleans after after Katrina, which said, you know what, we're not going to wait on the federal government. You know, if the federal government's going to give us help, we're going to take it. But we're going to take the bull by the horns, if you will, and we're going to start this process, and we're not going to wait. And there are examples of that around the country yeah. and, and around the uh, world. Uh, very quickly. I mean, Joplin has come up before. Yeah. Joplin, uh, uh, we were happy to help Joplin in any way we could, and we did. They didn't need much help. They really didn't. They, uh, between the private sector, the local government, the, the school superintendent that Admiral Allen talked about, and frankly, the state government, who had done a lot in terms of preparedness and had built agreements across borders with other yeah. folks. I mean, we came in there, we did it, we frankly did our normal post-disaster recovery programs, which are very much check-based and, and very much cash-based. Cash cash yeah. uh, but in terms of the response, in terms of the immediate life-saving and life-sustaining capabilities, the vast majority of that was done by the local and state government, which is how it should work. It's exactly how it should work. I think the lesson, or the, the, the case that really worked well that we should be uh, learning from is the Interstate Highway and Defense Act. And what it was was it was a, it, it was a package that was more about uh, jobs and about extending the suburban economic boom and the interests of Detroit and the interests of creating a unified market. And that also had requirements for being able to land uh, heavy bombers and, and supply um, aircraft um, uh, every few miles uh, along it, being able to move our missile systems under 14-foot bridges. And we were able to put the, the requirements that we needed to uh, meet the challenge of civil defense in the, in the Cold War on top of this fundamental infrastructure that opened up an in incredible new market. And so I think that's, that's where I would focus um, the effort. If you've got really 56% of demand out there for, um, for something, it, which is three times the amount of demand originally for housing after World War II, just to put it in scale. Um, figure out what the Interstate, Interstate Highway and Defense Act is, Interstate Highway and Resilience Act, and call it. it and, and frame it in that way. And frame it in that way and have it be about jobs right. and uh, market opportunity, um, not have it about um, resilience, because resilience is important, but it's right. not like I'm going to go out and buy the latest for, the, the, you know, Resilience 4S out there in, at, at the Apple store. Um, it's what you want to do is is is. I would totally buy that, back. by the way. 
<laughs> whatever that is. Um, look, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I very much appreciate it. Thank you for the questions.